Good morning and welcome to Life Moments, a podcast designed to inform, to inspire, and to motivate. I'm Terry Becks from your host. And today is January 26th. It's Friday. We're coming to you live from our World Broadcast Studio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Brad Smallwood, a financial genius. We're going to learn something about money, which I wish I'd had Brad a long time ago. Glad you joined us today. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today, Terry. It's great to be here. I enjoy your Life Moments podcast very much, and it's a pleasure to be a small part of your inspiration to others. Well, you're an inspiration to me. I tell you, you know, talking to Brad, I've learned a lot of things just in the in the little bit of time that we've had together. We had lunch the other day, and I was just amazed at how much you know about finances, and I wanted to kick myself for not learning from someone like you a long time ago. And I think that it's important that we, as both parents and as individuals, learn as much as we can about money. And I, I, like I said, I wish I had learned a lot of this a long time ago. But as you told me earlier, it's never too late to make some corrections. Brad, do this for us. Tell us about yourself. Now, I know about you, but the people listening don't. Uh, where are you from? Where have you lived? Uh, what did you do and what do you do now? Just kind of about your family, whatever you want to say. Just Brad well, Smallwood, you're up. Well, I'm originally from California, San Francisco. Uh, I've lived in Vancouver, Canada, uh, Houston, Texas, and grew up in a very small town most of my life in Simsbury, Connecticut. I went to school in Syracuse University up in New York, and then I went on to the Washington, D.C. area to pursue a master's degree in uh, criminal justice and criminology. Okay, we know that. Do you want to tell the folks about what you did as a career and where you are right now and a little about your family? Well, I started out in the Washington, D.C. area, and I was fortunate to land my dream job as a criminal investigator for the federal government. Last August, August 31st of 2018, I retired from federal law enforcement after 26 years. I'm married uh, to my beautiful wife, Laura, uh, for 21 years, and we have four amazing children. Fantastic. I've seen pictures of your kids. I haven't met uh, them or your wife, but they're all beautiful. And I'm sure you've got pictures on your website of them for people to look at as well. So tell us about what got you interested in the financial aspects of life. I know that you told me the other day a little about this, but uh, the whole aspect of savings, uh, you know, investing, retirement savings. How did you get involved with this stuff? Terry, I used to be a spender uh, as a typical teen in uh, my early years in college. I didn't save a dime. Uh, I remember when I got my first job, money came in, money was to spend, money was to buy things. Saving money was the furthest thing from my mind. Fortunately, my father, who is very frugal, borderline cheap, <laughs> kind of drilled it in my head over the years. Um, and there's a story about that because when I first started out in the Washington, D.C. area, country bars were really, really popular. And I remember on a trip to Austin, Texas, I decided while I was there that I was going to buy a cowboy hat. And not just any cowboy hat, I wanted a good cowboy hat. And so while I was down there, I went and I purchased a $400 resist all black gold cowboy hat. Wow. And I still have that hat today, even though I don't wear it very often. Occasionally I break it out on Halloween every year. But that hat became a point of contention with me and my father because for years and years, my father would tell me, and he would always mention and bring up that hat anytime I even thought about spending money, even on necessary purchases. He would make reference to that hat and he would drill into my head that I need to be saving my money. And I guess it worked because over the years and having been married and having four children, when I started working and settling, I started realizing that we really do need to save money for ourselves, for our kids, and for our future. Well, you know, talk, you talked to me the other day about your dad, too. Uh, you have an interesting father. And when you talked about uh, how he kind of inspired you to start saving and all, he was a very frugal man. Tell the folks a little about your dad. Uh, interesting gentleman, indeed. I admired my dad very much. He was a... Um, he retired as a commander in the U.S. Naval Reserves and also retired as the director of collections for the Travelers Insurance Company. Tell us about your website. 
and some of the topics that you like to write about. I was fascinated as I was reading through some of these things. And, and when I first started reading through them, I said, I've got to get this guy on the podcast because there's so much out there right now with people that we talked about, Dave Ramsey. There are a lot of folks out there that are giving out advice. A lot of people... I guess don't understand the practicality of it, especially at an early age. I certainly didn't, and I probably don't now. But tell us how you got involved in this and how you got involved with writing the website and and what the topics are that you have on there. Well, the way I looked at it was I had a lifetime of experiences saving, saving money. And this is information that was really gifted to me. It was gifted to be my, my father, by mentors, and just life skills that I acquired over the years, and I wanted to pass this information along, specifically to my children, but to others as well, because I knew people could benefit from it. So last January, I started my own website. It's called www.simplesaver, S-S-I-M-P-L-E-S-A-V-E-R. There's two S's on simple. So www.ssimplesaver. It was kind of just a brainstorm where I wanted a place to collect my ideas and have the freedom to write about any articles about money, saving money, and helping people prepare for their financial future. There's so much information available to everyone out there on the website. Sometimes it's complicated and it's a daunting task to sort through it and to figure out what do people need. And so my writings are to help people get back to the basics, basics of saving money. That's important. Now that we know about your website, and folks can look that up, and I encourage them to do so. Okay, now that we know about your website, let's talk about some practical applications and what we can do to be better spenders of our money. Talk about some personal home automobile, uh, shopping things that you can give us some applications so that we can understand what we can do better. Certainly. Uh, With personal habits, for example, when it comes to personal habits, it's very simple. Always pay yourself first. That means before your mortgage or rent, before your car payments, before you even spend a single penny, you're paying yourself first. And ideally, it should be 10 to 15 percent of every dollar that you earn. This money is set aside and invested for your future, and you can't forget that. Most people will say, I can't afford to do this, and I will tell them with an emphatic, you can't afford not to. This is about your future, and nobody else is going to do it for you. Well, and I look back myself and and my wife and how we've made mistakes, and you and I have talked about this. I think that a lot of people out there, they have the misperception or misconception that if you have money, you have to spend it. And I think that so many people make that mistake and they spend, as we talked about earlier, to the level of their income. And so if their income is high, they're spending more money. If their income goes lower, they're spending uh, less money. But I think there are a lot of people out there who make the mistake, and this starts early in their life, of just spending whatever they have. Uh, can you talk about that a little, a little bit? Absolutely. We're a society of spenders. We're, we're bombarded by advertisements. Everywhere you turn, people are wanting to get a hold of your hard-earned money. Meeting and staying within your means, unfortunately, isn't good enough. If you make $2,000 a month and you're spending $2,000 a month, you're not saving anything for your future. And that's important, and a lot of people don't realize that. When you look at the national debt and what the average consumer spends on credit card debt, the average interest rate on a credit card now is over 16%. Wow. And how do you expect, how do the banks expect people to pay off their cards and to get out of debt? Well, guess what? They don't. They need consumers to spend and to stay in debt. That's how they make money. I think I read somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the credit cards have it figured out to where if you pay the minimum payment every month, they basically can string you on for 20 or 30 years to where you're just paying interest off of it and you're never knocking the principal out. And a lot of people, well, they just go and they max out a credit card. And when that's maxed out, they start using another one, apply for another one. And before you know it, you've got this snowball effect where people are really in debt. And uh, certainly, I think people need to understand that. I, I enjoyed this morning. Uh, we were having coffee earlier, and my son came down. He's 20 years old, and you were talking to him about finances. And boy, how important it is for somebody, a young person especially. And if, if you're a, a teenager or 
early 20s out there and you're listening to the podcast right now, I would say listen up closely to Brad. So Brad, uh, give them some of the advice that, that you gave my son a little earlier about what a young person can do to not make the mistakes financially that some of us older folks have made. It's actually pretty simple. You have to spend within your means. You have to save. Ideally, you're saving 10 to 15 percent of every dollar that you make. And the benefit for young people is they have the time value of money. They have time on their side. So through the miracle of compound interest, investing in a low-cost index mutual fund, they will be set financially. But they have the benefit because they get to start early and they'll have more years for that, that money to grow. Now, hopefully people are taking that advice you talked about, how if a young person does it right, that they can easily retire a millionaire. It's not that difficult. I wish someone had told me that a long time ago. But let, let's talk about uh, some of the biggest financial mistakes. In your mind, what are some of the biggest financial mistakes that individuals and families make when it comes to money and finances? The biggest one is that most people don't live within their financial means. In other words, they're spending a lot more than they make. Um, as I said before, Americans now have more debt than ever before. Mortgage debt has hit its highest level in nine years. And basically, we're a society of spenders. Credit card balances are also at all-time highs. And again, with the credit card interest rates climbing, how do people expect to get out of debt when they're paying 16% to these credit card companies? So what's your advice? I don't think that you are going to suggest we don't use credit cards, but what's your advice for people not getting into that position? How do, how do they, you know, I guess it's, it goes down to spending within your means, as you talked about, but what are some things that people can do to avoid uh, the mistakes? Or if they're already there, what can they do to get out of these holes they're in? Well, everybody is somewhere on their financial journey. Uh, and everybody has the same goal of being financially secure when it comes time to retire. And so no matter where you are today, it's not too late. The biggest advice that I can have is take a look at where your money is going every month. When I talk to people, a lot of people don't really realize where their money is going and how much they're spending and how much the little dollars add up each month. What they do realize is the paycheck comes in and before they know it, the paycheck's gone and most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Do you think that most people do a budget or do most people avoid budgeting? Well, first off, I never like the term budget. I think budget ter takes a, it has a negative connotation. I like to call it a spending plan. That you need sense. to know where your money is going. I think some people try to budget. Some people are very good at budgeting, but they need to take a harder look at needs versus wants on everything. And I remember when my wife and I were first starting out and she was struggling with the decision of whether she should stay working in, she had a very good job at the bank uh, as the branch manager for the headquarters branch. And she was trying to decide and struggling with, should she stay home and raise the four children or should she stay in and work? And ultimately she had decided that she wanted to stay home and raise the four children. So we had the challenge of going from two incomes down to one income. And so we had to take a really hard look at what our monthly expenses were every single month. And we actually went down line by line every dollar that we had. And we had to evaluate, where do we want this money to go? And mind you, it was always still with having the 10 to 15 percent automatically allocated, paying yourself first, set aside for our futures. Let's branch off here for a second. So I've known guys, I've actually worked with guys whose wife decided that, that she was going to work and they had kids. I knew a guy who uh, had multiple kids and they paid an outrageous sum of money each month for childcare, but the wife went to work. And I think he once told me that they spent almost all of his wife's income paying for the child care. What's your opinion on mothers or one of the spouses staying home with the kids? I know that we struggle with that. Uh, my wife was a career person uh, when we got married and when we had our first, our, our only child. We eventually made the decision for her to stay home with my son, but there were a number of years where we were you know, paying a lot of money in child care 
And I think that that a lot of people nowadays, they kind of struggle with that notion because society is kind of pushed on, well, both parents should work. And I think a lot of kids are being raised uh, by people who are not, are, are not their parents. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right. And I'll leave it with this. It's a very personal decision to each family. So there is no right or wrong. I was very pleased that my wife decided to stay home and raise the children. And I remember when she was trying to decide, she asked me, what do you think? And I would tell her, if you work, our life will be like this. And so she took a couple of weeks. She came back and she said, you're right. If I work, our life will be like this. And I said, but if you stay home and raise the children, our life would be like this. So she went and thought about it. And she come back and she's like, you're not helping me. And I told her, this has to be your decision because I'm going to be here to help you make the decision and evaluate both sides. But ultimately, any decision you make for me is going to be the wrong one 20 years from now. Again, it has to be her decision or his decision as to whether it's in the family's best interest for people to stay home and take care of the kids or for both parents to work. Good advice. So let's talk briefly about college tuition. I know that's a big thing that a lot of parents struggle with each year, and I've read a lot of articles about the debt that college kids incur and that parents incur paying for colleges. What's your advice for a parent who's got perhaps a kid who's in grade school right now who hadn't really thought about it. What about saving for college? And then kind of give us your thoughts about going into debt over college. This is an important topic. And since our oldest is the second year at UNC Chapel Hill and our second one is getting ready to go off to college next year, I will tell parents this. When it comes to saving for your kid's college education, you have to save for your retirement first. If necessary, your kids can borrow money for college. You and I can't borrow money to fund our own retirement. Ideally, parents should start saving for college as early as they can. I know my wife and I, we started when each one of our children were born. We started setting aside just a little bit of money. Again, we were on one income, so we, you know, we opened our accounts with $100 and the most we could contribute each month was $25. But we started doing that. We started doing that for each child, and over the years, we would slowly add to it. If you can start early, it's always the better option. It'll be easier in the long run. What are your thoughts about students who come out of college and they have a hundred, sometimes more, thousand dollars in debt from college? And it seems overwhelming for a lot of these kids uh, that they have to spend really their first few years working. And some people, uh, you know, I've heard of kids who uh, 20 years later are still paying off their college loan. If, let's say, the parent didn't save and didn't uh, make the right decisions and the kid is, uh, or the college student is incurring the expenses themselves via, or themselves via student loans, what's your advice to them? What are people doing wrong as far as student loans are concerned? My opinion of college has changed over the years. Uh, Having worked as a manager and hiring people, I see college degrees now as necessary, but it's about the value that you get. So for me, and especially having four children, I've thought a lot about this. Colleges, there's some great colleges out there, especially in this area, that charge in-state tuition prices. So when it comes down to in-state tuition versus, you know, for a public school or university versus a private university, it really comes down to, for me, how can I get four of my children through school with the minimal student loans and debt that will help them get a head start in their futures? So it is something, and it pains me to hear stories about people and young people being strapped with an insurmountable amount of debt when they're starting life that they are going to have to spend many, many years trying to get out from under and paying off in their future. I think we're handcuffing our children as they're moving off into life because they're already starting at a disadvantage. My opinion to parents, when your children go off to school, evaluate the colleges. Where can your son or daughter get the best education for the least amount of money or the best price? 
because I've learned over the years it's not necessarily where you graduated from that's important. It's the fact that you graduated. It's the fact that you made the most of your education while you're there. One of the ideas that I love is I'm a strong believer in having the children go to a community college for two years and then transfer in. Transferring in to the university of their choice is much easier because they're transferring. Most of the credits transfer and they're going to the first two years of school at a fraction of the cost that it would cost to go to a regular university. Uh, it's fantastic advice. And, and I think so many parents and kids say, well, I want to go to whatever university. I want to go to Clemson University because they won this national championship. And, uh, well, wait a minute, we're talking about out-of-state tuition here. And they say, okay, well, let's just go for it. You know, people just really get into debt. And I, I was thinking uh, the other day, and I, I was talking to somebody, and, and I, I remember my first semester of college was $600 for that first semester and it wasn't that much more and it progressively got higher and higher certainly nowadays it is just outrageous you know some schools are fifty sixty thousand dollars and even more a year to attend but i contrast that to the days when you and i were in college i don't remember them having that country club look either where they had pools and 50 million dollar uh, gyms to go to in these fancy dorms they were there as a uh, you know a source of education not as like a country club like so many of them look today and the, the prices are just you know through the roof we could probably go on for a long time about that so brad let's talk about some of the things that that get people to spend money we i ask you about uh some of the psychological ploys and marketing that advertisers use to get people to feel like they have to spend money and boy we're just bombarded every day with the notion that we have to spend 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 you got to buy this, you got to buy that if you don't have the latest car. And we all kind of get sucked into that. What are your thoughts about what we can do besides turning the TV off uh, or not opening magazines uh, and not falling into the trap of, of these marketing ploys that, that hit us literally every day? Well, you're absolutely right. Take a look at your mailbox every day. Look at the emails you receive every day. You can't search the internet without being bombarded by advertisements. Again, everybody want some of your hard-earned money. That's why advertising is such a big, powerful business. It's all about getting us to spend money, and in turn, people fall victims to these advertising schemes, and it doesn't matter with what you're purchasing. We need to change our mindset and protect ourselves. I encourage everyone to really evaluate every purchase as a need versus want. Ask yourself, do I really need it, or do I just want it? Something my father taught me many years ago, if you still want it two weeks from now, then go back and buy it. But chances are, after two weeks, you're going to realize that either you just don't need it or you just don't want it anymore. That's great advice. And, and one of the things that I talk about, and it's uh, I'm kind of ashamed to say, is if I go into my closet, there are a lot of items in my closet, you know, whether they're clothes or shoes or whatever, that still have the tags on them. They might still be in the box. And back when you bought them, you said, well, this is a good idea. I need this. I have a shirt that literally is a threat. It's a dress shirt that is in the box that has never come out. It was a very expensive shirt and it's sitting on the shelf in my closet. And I bought that shirt 25 years ago. And that is just kind of crazy. You know, I, I think the, a lot of parents, and if you're out there and you're listening and you're probably smiling right now, you know what I'm talking about, but you spend a lot of money buying things that you think that you want or that you need. And when you get to be in your 40s or 50s uh, or 60s, you open up your closet, you open up your storage shed, you open up your attic, and you've got all this stuff that's accumulated over the years that you thought you needed. And a lot of it you never touched. That's great advice. Anything else you want to say about that? And then, you know, I'll say in closing on this particular matter, you spend the next X number of years trying to get rid of this stuff. You do garage sales, whatever. And then eventually you get to the point, which is, I think, where we're getting to now is you just start giving stuff away, giving it to charity or whatever. Even though you may have paid a lot of money for it at some point, it's obsolete now. It's never been used, but you end up giving it away. Any thoughts on on? hoarding and accumulating stuff that you don't need. Terry, I think actually you should keep that shirt because it is symbolic. It really is. When you look at that shirt that you bought 25 years ago, still has the price tags on it and still in a box, that should be your reminder every day 
when you're going out and purchasing new things. Look at that and think about that shirt because you're going to reflect on that. So it is. It's an important symbol of helping you move forward and helping us all move forward of evaluating needs versus wants. And that's good advice. I'm going to back you up for just a second because uh, when you and I had lunch the other day, you were talking about different aspects of spending and how you could save money and certain things. We talked about cars. One of the things that I really appreciated about what you're saying, I was kind of shocked is that you told me you basically had learned how to do some mechanical work and you use YouTube to learn how to fix things like your alarm system and just kind of sitting there in shock, listening to all the stuff you have self-taught yourself essentially via YouTube. Can you tell us a little about that, about how you learn to do things that you would have normally paid people hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to do and how that's kind of saved you money over the years? Terry, YouTube is one of the most valuable resources out there today. Uh, it's had such an impact on my life. I never used to be that handy. Years ago, I would shy away from anything that needed to be fixed because I just didn't know how to fix it. YouTube now, you can go on there and see demonstrations of everything. I remember years ago, I had um, we had a screened-in porch, and I had a construction contractor come out to give me an estimate on how much it would cost to close it in with windows and make it a three to four season room. And he told me he could do everything that I wanted to do for $18,000. And that's a lot of money. Yeah. I'm not sure where I got the incentive or the belief that I could actually accomplish it on my own, but I, I went to YouTube and I started just with the basics and through the steps. And over the course of a little over a year, I was able to close in our screened-in porch to make it match the house. And I look back on that now, and I think about how much money I saved, because my out-of-pocket expenses was about $3,500. And most of that was just in the in the double-pane windows. Well, and uh, I think it's incredible that you were able, able to do that. Again, it kind of hit on a point that I found interesting, is you didn't believe necessarily that you could do it. And I think that's probably, that's my probably biggest impediment is you don't believe that you could be able to to pull some of this stuff i don't believe i could be able to change the brakes on my car so i'm going to go out and pay somebody six hundred dollars to do it i guess you have to come to the point where you say you know what i can do this and give it a try it's something i guess a lot of people aren't willing to do i found what what worked for me was having the confidence to do it to at least just try and one of my recommendations to everyone is everybody has friends. Your friends are knowledgeable and skilled in areas that you may not even be aware of. If you talk to your friends, you'd be amazed at what people have accomplished out there. I give credit to a great friend of mine, Sean McHenry. He taught me more about working on cars than I ever thought was possible. I was afraid to work on cars, but just having him there guiding me, watching him do what turned out to be pretty simple repairs. And now, again, through YouTube, I've done more repairs on my car that I never would have tackled years ago. So is this stuff more simple than it looks when you learn how to do it? Actually, it is. Well, it, it, it really can be, and I think that you will be really surprised. And this is what I challenge people. If something's broken in your house or something that needs to be replaced before you pick up the phone to call the serviceman or service woman or whoever to come out there and fix it for you just take a look on YouTube many times you can actually troubleshoot your own problems and fix them yourself and I'll give you one quick example our um, washing machine got stuck the the light just got stuck it was like it was frozen and I did a little quick search online, and I learned very quickly that, like most electronics, you simply had to reboot the system. And they showed me how to do that, and within just a few minutes, the washing machine was back up and running just like it normally was. We had the same thing that happened with our dishwasher. It lost complete power. I did a little quick research online and realized that I just needed to reboot the dishwasher. Again, it would have been too simple for me to pick up the phone and call a repairman to come out and fix something that really didn't need to be fixed at all. I think back to a time 
not too long ago where we needed some electrical work done in the house and it was fairly simplistic things, not things that I probably couldn't have learned how to do uh, via YouTube, but one of them was putting a couple ceiling fans in where there were already outlets, also doing some repair work with some of the electrical stuff. And I, and I thought that when I had the guy come out to look at it, that it was going to be a job that he would probably charge two or three hundred dollars for. They sent a guy out to do an estimate, which I thought was really bizarre. He was not the electrician who was going to do the work. He was just an estimator. And I'd never heard of that, that they would send somebody out like that. But he came and he spent 30 minutes at the house with me describing this stuff. He said, well, I'm going to have to send you the estimate. I can't give it to you right now. And I thought, that, well, this is really bizarre now. Two days later, I get an estimate for $2,200 to come in and do these repairs. Needless to say, he wasn't hired. But I hate to say it, but I think there are a lot of people, and, and certainly not everyone in the service industry is like this, but there are a lot of people trying to really get rich off people. And I guess the naive ones I've been in that category many times. We'll simply say, okay, come on out and do the work. I guess uh, it has to be done, but uh, that's great advice. Okay, so Brad, uh, you've given us some great advice. I want to touch on a couple things before I let you go. You talked to me the other day about shopping and how with groceries uh, you had some advice on saving money. What do, you, what do you have to say about that? When it comes to shopping and groceries, buying anything, again, look online. If you're making purchases online, it's amazing. Before you get ready to check out, if you see the discount box, there's always a box on there that says discount code. That is always my reminder to do a separate Google search on discount code for whatever store that I'm planning on buying from. And most of the time, I'm able to get, whether it be a 5% off, 10% off, sometimes it's even 20% off. But the deals are out there. And we've always made a game of it throughout our lives. Anytime we buy anything, my first question is, do we need it? Two, can we get it on a, at a discount? And three, where is this purchase going to be five, ten years from now? Is it going to be like your shirt In that I'm going to have right. 25 years from now? So again, it's evaluating your purchases. Can you get it on sale at a discount somewhere? Who's got the cheapest price? And do you believe in coupons? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they're out there. But remember this, too. Coupons are there to get you to spend. Right. So coupons are great, but if it's not something that you would normally purchase, then you're just spending your money. Again, you're falling into the trap of the advertisements, getting you to spend money. I hadn't even thought about the uh, issue of... Uh them inciting you to buy when maybe you don't need something. But I was at the grocery store the other day and kid behind the counter said, you know, sir, you should really think about using coupons. And uh, I looked at him like he was crazy. And I said, oh yeah. And he said, yeah. He said, you could have saved a lot of money off of this. And he said, the person that was here before you, he said they use coupons. And he said their bill was $79 and some odd cents. And he said, after their coupons, they ended up spending 79 cents. And I looked at the guy like he was absolutely crazy, but he said, I'm telling you the truth. So I guess these coupon folks actually know what they're doing. But So let me get this straight. A young person actually educated an old person? Yeah, well, I, I don't necessarily think I'm old. I'm not ready to take on that title just yet. So um, before I let you go, I want you to speak, if you will, to the whole issue of retirement. Because a lot of people, they don't want to think about retirement until they, you know, reach a certain age. I, you know, if I had to guess in my mind, I'd say probably 50, 60 years old is when people say, well, I guess I should start thinking about retirement. You told me something that was interesting the other day is that actually you should start thinking about retirement when you're really young. And then you won't have such a burden uh, when you turn 65 or, or whenever you want to retire. Can you talk briefly about the whole issue of retirement? saving for retirement, and maybe some advice on investing. Sure. Again, no matter where you are in life, it's never too early or too late to start preparing for retirement. Ideally, the perfect time to start saving and preparing is when you're young. But even if you're later in your years, like me, it's never too late. Today, wherever you are, is the perfect time to start saving. Even if you think, I wish I started saving earlier, you can still be instrumental with helping your children start preparing for their financial futures. You can also look at it this way. If your children are financially secure, they're going to be in a much better position to take care of you when we get old. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, that's an interesting point because I hear stories about a lot of uh, kids who, as they get older, some of them end up moving back in with their parents because they're in dire straits financially. So it's great advice. And the whole issue of saving 15% of every dollar is, is just brilliant. And I think that if people take this advice, that uh, they'll probably do a lot better financially than they expected to. So any other things that you want to talk about before we wrap this thing up? Terry, I just want to thank you again for having me as a guest speaker on your podcast. Uh, Your Life Moments podcast inspire me, something I've learned over the years. The greatest gift we have is giving to others, helping others, teaching others, and passing along our knowledge. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I appreciate that. And you can pick up your $5 as you exit (laughs) today for that kind comment. So, Brad, before I let you go, you got to tell people again how it is they can link into your website. I told Brad the other day that he really needed to start a consulting business. And I think he's actually thinking about that because just sitting down with him for lunch the other day, I said, boy, you need to come over to my house, sit down with me and my wife and kind of just go over things. Tell us where we're making some mistakes. You know, we talked about issues about cable and saving money there. So I'm hoping that people will check out your website and then eventually perhaps be able to to link in with you to where they can uh, maybe hire you to do some consulting work for them. I'd be happy to do that. For those who are interested, please visit my website. Again, it's www.ssimplesaver.com. Simple Saver with two S's on the front, dot com. Or you can send me an email at ssimplesaver at yahoo.com. Again, Simple Saver with two S's at yahoo.com. Read some of my articles. I hope you'll be inspired by them, and they help set you on your own course for a secure financial future. All right. Well, I've been inspired by Brad. I hope you guys have as well. Uh, I just wish that uh, Brad weren't closer to my age and that he had been around when I was about 15 years old. I actually started working uh, on a paper route when I was 12. I wish I'd started back then at 15%. But Brad, thank you very much for being here. It's been an inspiration. You obviously know what you're talking about. So thanks for joining us today. I hope you have a great weekend, and I hope you visit us next week and join us for the podcast then. We'll have something special, and maybe not as good as Brad, but uh, we'll have something for you. Thank you, Terry.